hearing from the experts at Caltech and the USGS, they say this was a relatively shallow earthquake. Yeah, I think about a mile yeah. down. Well, our CBS 2's Dave Bryan continues our team coverage now. He is live from Caltech in Pasadena. Dave? Well, that's right, Pat and Paul. This is a beehive of activity tonight, and, and I think beside me here you can see uh, Dr. Lucy Jones and Robert Graves from the U.S. Geological Survey. In just a moment, they'll be speaking to us and giving us the latest updates. Uh, they have been studying the parameters of this earthquake, uh, the fault that uh, where it occurred. Now you can see some of the maps in the background. See that 3.1 there? That was an aftershock that we got here about 20 minutes ago. There have been more than 20 aftershocks altogether. I'm I'm going to move out of the way here and we're going to listen to what the scientists are saying and find out the latest information. Just to update the latest information that we have, or just to recap, 909 this evening we had a magnitude 5.1 earthquake. It was uh, one mile east of La Habra, about four miles north of Fullerton. It occurred at a depth of about five miles beneath the surface. Uh, it was preceded by a magnitude 3.6 foreshock that occurred at 8.03 p.m. this evening. Uh, up to this time, we've had over 30 aftershocks that we've recorded. Uh, three of those aftershocks have been greater than magnitude three. We expect the aftershocks, obviously, to continue uh, throughout the evening. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of reports of uh, very minor, um, uh, uh, not damage per se, but uh, material falling off shelves and so forth. No reports of any structural damage. Uh, the intensities of the shaking were fairly strong. Uh, our instrumental intensity right in the epicentral region was up to uh, a, a level of intensity seven. Uh, that's very strong, very noticeable, obviously, and there are a number of reports that people have felt this earthquake. Um, as I said, we expect the aftershocks to continue throughout the evening. There is a, a small chance that this uh, uh, we might have a, a larger magnitude event. The chances of that decrease with time uh, as we'll go through the evening. Uh, just to point out, uh, this is an area that is near the magna, uh, magnitude 5.4 earthquake that occurred in 2008 in Chino Hills, uh, but it is not, uh, we don't think that there's any association between those two events. Uh, that event was much deeper. It occurred uh, at about 10 to 12 miles, and this, this event tonight is, is shallower. Can you tell us anything more about the, the fault involved in tonight's earthquake uh, what, and whether it was associated with any other former earthquakes? Well, uh, as far as sp specifics on the fault, we don't have definitive information and it's going to take a while to try to, to discern that. There are several active faults in that region that have been mapped. If we don't have a rupture that breaks right up to the surface, it takes a little bit of time to, to do that investigation. As far as uh, previous earthquakes in that area. Uh, let me turn it over to Dr. Lucy Jones. She has a, some information about that. We actually, going back to the source, Dr. Richter's book published in 1957, there is a magnitude, well, an earthquake before they had determined them, before they determined the magnitude scale, so he did not assign a magnitude to it. It looks to be a little larger than this one. It had a maximum intensity of eight, and we have a maximum intensity of seven in this event very near the location. He called it the Whittier earthquake, and it happened on July 8th in 1929. So you believe that's the last time this, whatever fault this is, seismic structure broke was there? Well, this is the last time there was an earthquake this large, and, and right in there. But of course, nearby, we have both the Chino Hills earthquake and the Whittier Narrows earthquake in 1987. You don't know what fault it is. How long is this fault? We don't know how long it is. Wait, right, it's, it's associated it's near the Puente Hills thrust. Given that we can't say for de definitively on any earthquake of this side, we can say there's some you know, association with the Puente Hills thrust, which of course is, a, is, you know, so if you're asking the question, how big could something near here happen? The answer is very big, but that's also, of course, the same answer of much of Los Angeles. Right, and you what, had a pre-shock prior to this one, excuse me, of an hour and three minutes. What are the chances that this is a poor shock to something larger? Okay, the f every earthquake has about a 5% chance of being followed by something larger. The fact that this had a four shock doesn't particularly increase that probability. So. Uh, still on the order of 5%. Can you answer questions that you have about this earthquake event. in 1987 earthquake in Whittier? Can you rule out that that is the same fault line, or are you just not sure? No, no, we can absolutely rule it out. For one thing, if you look on the map that we have here, 
Uh, it's a long ways away from the 1987 earthquake, which you can see is uh, up there, sort of in the middle of the figure. And this morning, and this and this evening's is is quite far down. So no, it's not the same structure, as it's not the same location as 1987. 1929 is the last time we had earthquake in this location. Uh, yeah. What are the questions you have about this activity, and will you be examining data, or is there anything physically you'll be looking at? Well, yeah, clearly we, we have a lot of information that's coming in, a lot of data that we will continue to analyze. Obviously questions such as what, can we identify the fault structure, is that linked up to other faults, getting an idea of how those faults might be uh, interacting, you know, those are certainly questions that we'll be looking at. Um, as we had talked about previously and as Dr. Jones has indicated, the Los Angeles region is crisscrossed by many, many active faults, and it's a very complicated uh, set of ge geological uh, uh, structures. And so to try to uh, discern exactly what happened when an earthquake occurs five miles or 10 miles beneath the surface takes a bit of time. And uh, so w we will continue to do that, or continue to work on that, and, and hopefully come up with some more definitive information. Well, are you thinking, are there you thinking that, that there was an indication that uh, this was the end of the dry spell? You have 20 years of yeah. abnormally uh, small uh, seismic activity. Yeah, well, uh, and, and I wouldn't uh, necessarily go so far as to say it's the end of the dry spell, but it is certainly something that we would, it, it is typical for the Los Angeles region. Um, and it's part of the, I would say, the natural cycle. Uh, you know, as we had talked about before, this is another reminder. Uh, we live in earthquake country in Southern California, um, and you know, this is uh, an earthquake that is not terribly damaging, but uh, it should be taken to heart that we can have larger, more damaging earthquakes. I, I would say March 17th, we said we can't tell for certain if this is the end. If the end of the drought, we'll have to wait and see if other things happen. And earlier. Yeah. The, the more we have, it's, it's like asking if a particular storm or, or the drought is associated with climate change. At some point, you get enough data and you finally go, okay, I'm overwhelmed. Any one individual one, you really can't say. Earlier, you had said that this was a very shallow uh, earthquake, only a mile deep. Now you, now you say maybe five miles. What, what changed and what, what's the significance of that? Yeah. Uh, so the very initial or preliminary estimates that came in indicated that it was relatively shallow. And it's a, it's a process. There's, there's a lot of information that's coming in. It's continually being monitored, uh, automated computer systems. And then we have the technicians that can go in and actually do a more rigorous and detailed analysis. And so that's why we had the revision on the depth. It's, you know, it, it's part of the process. We want to get out as accurate information as possible, but we also want to be able to give out information as it, as it becomes available. Is there anything remarkable about this quake beyond the fact that it happened in a populated area and we noticed it? Well, yeah. It, uh, I would say this is the kind of earthquake that is typical for the Los Angeles region. And it, uh, you're absolutely right. If this earthquake had occurred out in the desert, some other less populated area, uh, it certainly would not have caused quite a bit of interest. I doubt many of you would not be here. Um, so the fact that it was felt by a number of people uh, means that there's a lot of people that are interested in it. It's very typical in terms of the fault structures we have in the Los Angeles region, though. Uh, as I had mentioned before, there's a number of active faults. Many of those we have not even identified because they're at depth. And so th this earthquake is, is typical in that I, sense. I, I want this is very normal, but the normal includes a very wide range of rates of aftershocks. And so this is on the higher side of the average. Nothing at all abnormal about it, because we see very large variations. And there have been plenty of sequences with even more aftershocks than this one. But it's definitely a, a good, healthy aftershock sequence. How many quakes in total, regardless of size, have you counted so far? Is that number unusually high? Just on the high side of average. Yeah, and, and so uh, we've recorded, that is with our monitoring equipment, recorded uh, over 30, almost 40 earth, uh, aftershocks. Uh, for, as Dr. Jones had said, for this uh, magnitude and this time period, we're now at about two hours after the main shock. That's on the high side, but it's not abnormal in terms of the aftershock, the number of aftershocks for an earthquake of this size. Was, and and you, was this well, you know Hill's earthquake the, the last one uh, of, of the magnitude uh, higher than this one? 
in, in, in the LA area, if you go all of Southern California, we've had a few fives like down on the San Jacinto Fault. But for the LA metropolitan area, this is the first five since Chino Hills. So the early warning system, four seconds. You're, you're in, oh, you're in, you're in. And now we're having an aftershock. Okay. So, well, there you go. That, that's estimated magnitude. Right, and, and, 2.6. And, and, yeah, and the intensity is one, which is basically no shaking, and obviously we didn't shake. Well, we're we're off, that, that, that's, a, that's a nice segue apart. into my question. Four Next seconds is what you had for the main shock. Why right. is four seconds that important? Because with four seconds, on a five, it isn't. On a five, it lets you go, well, it's a very important psychological thing. Four seconds, it's going to be weak shaking. Oh, it's not going to be that bad. Four seconds, it's only going to be a five. I'm going to be okay. That's because, isn't that feeling when you first feel an earthquake and you're nearby, oh heavens, is it going to get bigger? Is this going to be a six? Is it going to be seven? Is this going to be the big one? One of the things the early warning does is a bit of psychological reassurance to say, oh, it's only the small. Now, now imagine it's four seconds to a magnitude seven. There are still lots of things that you could do. 11 o'clock at night, there are probably not many dentists out there with drills in people's mouths, but there are probably some surgeons with knives in people's chests. And it would be something that you can take out, that you can stop that. You can stop the trains. You can take every elevator and move it to the nearest floor so that you are not uh, getting caught in an elevator. Those are the things that matter. There are lots more that matter when it's a really big earthquake. As People are time. noting a n number of different uh, sensations from the, the shaking that they received. Should that signal to them how uh, a larger earthquake could impact their home if they were at home tonight? Well, right, what they feel is going to be two things. There's one aspect, the, your local soil conditions that, that Dr. Graves has talked about. If you have a, a deep basin, you might have longer shaking that, that goes on, and that all scales through all of the possible earthquakes. But we also need to remember that a lot of what you're feeling depends on how close you are to the earthquake. So what you felt tonight doesn't apply in general. It applies only to earthquakes from this location because when you're right on top of, a, of an earthquake, you feel all the frequencies and your body really notices the high frequencies. When you're farther away, the high frequencies have died off and you're just left with the low frequencies and it feels like a rolling motion. So you have some people saying this was a jerky earthquake, some saying this was rolling. What you're hearing is how far away they were. As but more they, time passes and the intensity of the aftershocks continue to decrease, how does the likelihood of a stronger earthquake happening go down? I want to correct one thing. The intensity does not decrease. And actually, intensity is what's shaking you feel. You're probably meaning magnitude. magnitude yes. But the magnitude itself does not decrease. The, the relative number of large to small is the most constant feature we have about earthquakes. For every magnitude 5, on average, we're going to see 10 4s, 100 3s, 1,000 2s, 10,000 1s. That's true in an aftershock sequence as well. So the number is going down. Your probability of having a big one also goes down. So right when the earthquake happens, your probability of having a magnitude 3 after a magnitude 5 is almost certain. It's, it's not almost it, it's about well above 50 percent, right? By the time we get to a week out, we're going to have still, you know, a day chance, your one day chance of having a three is getting down, your week chance of having a three in the second week, about 50-50. So all of those things drop with time, and then the five scale with the threes. Whatever your probability of a three is, your probability of a five is, is one percent of that. I guess my question is, at the 5.1 magnitude, you said a one in 20 chance that a bigger right. one would follow. How does that fraction get larger over time? It goes down with time. So uh, that's a three-day probability. And uh, of that, one, one quarter of those all happen in the first hour. If we get one hour away from the earthquake, which we already are, now you've lost that, you're down to about three and a half percent. So we probably shouldn't be saying five percent anymore. By the time we get to tomorrow morning, it's going to be down close to one percent. By the time we get another, to the end of the weekend, the probability is essentially gone. A lot of people may be taking a leap that the, the March 17th earthquake was related to this quake. Is there... Okay, all right. A lot of people might be thinking Yeah, and, and 15 years ago, our answer would have been no coincidence. Now, with the more uh, extensive statistical studies that we've, we've done, we do see that the probability of having an earthquake goes up. One earthquake happens, the probability goes up, the probability dies off with distance, 
But so when you're far away, it's just a little bit of increase in probability, but there is an increase. So all of the LA basin has got a somewhat increased probability of having an earthquake. Well, this one happened. Now we've added another little increase to the probability over the whole LA basin, and it will die off with time. Probably it won't happen, and if it does, it's only going to be in one location. All those other ones won't have gotten it. But yes, we now see a bit of a relationship. Can you tell us if you, though, that people watching this going to bed at night, very concerned, what advice do you offer them? Go, all right, that's, all right, the advice for tonight, probably this is it. There is enough chance that this isn't it, a few percent chance that it's worth doing some things. If you, the things you should have done already, but maybe not got around to, don't put your child to bed underneath a tall bookcase that could fall over on him tonight. Don't put him under a glass framed picture, all right? Do some of those things that you should have done anyway. This weekend would be a great time to go look at earthquakecountry.org and find the other things that you could do. And on that note, I think I'll thank you for can coming I, and talking with us. Can I ask you on, on the maps and the charts here, is there, is there anything that we should be looking for that can help uh, us understand uh, the context of this earthquake? Well, yeah, just very quickly, just to explain what's on this map. Uh, the, the red dots here are some of the more significant earthquakes we've had in the past uh, 20 years or so. This is Whittier Narrows earthquake. All these little black symbols, those are smaller earthquakes. And so one of the main points is, you really can't go anywhere in the LA region and get away from earthquakes. The earthquake we had tonight is centered right here. So there's a number of faults, and getting back to what Dr. Jones had said earlier, we're now recognizing that this whole system of faults is very complicated. And so to try to draw an association, say, between last week's earthquake and this earthquake, yeah, they are related in some sense. There's not a direct cause and effect that we can identify, but certainly they're related. So I would say one of the main points is, you know, again, we live in earthquake country, and the chances of having an earthquake in the Los Angeles region or being nearby uh, are pretty great. I don't know if this is the right uh, analysis of what you said, but I thought I heard the more earthquakes we get, the more likely we are to get more. Yeah, that is, that is true in a certain sense, and that actually was what Dr. Jones was talking about. We've seen that statistically uh, throughout the world. When earthquakes happen, we tend to get more earthquakes. And so there's definitely a relationship. They don't have to be right on the same fault. They can be on nearby faults. And, and it's something we don't necessarily understand the details, but uh, it, 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 it is certainly possible and it's documented that that does occur. You often make the point that because we live in the space and we have the mountains there, we see the foothills, all those were caused by significant size. Right. The, the beauty of Southern California, uh, a lot of uh, what we have, the mountains, uh, is definitely related to earthquakes that have happened over millennia. And uh, it's just part of the process. This looks like a lot of activity here on, on the map. Over yeah, what period uh, of time is this? Uh, this, I think, goes back uh, about 20 years. Actually, I think it's 30. It's, I think it's 1981. Okay, so 30, 30 years. Yeah, so there's, you know, a, a quite a time period and encompassed if you went there. To Charles Richter's book, it, it would be twice that. Right, and in fact, this, this is fairly complete over that 30-year period because we've had the dense instrumentation. But earthquakes have, have occurred here for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so I think with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up from here. We'll let you know if we have any more updates later. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Graves and Dr. Jones. It has to be five before we come back.